Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are going to finish up chapter six, our chapter on strategic management. This is part two of the chapter, part two of the lecture. Okay, so the agenda for today, we're just gonna go through a quick review. Uh, we began the strategy process uh, in the first part of the lecture. So I'll just give a quick review of that and then we'll go and complete the remaining steps, steps three, four, and five of the strategic management process. So review. Um, so this chapter deals with uh, whether a company can generate a sustained competitive advantage. Um, and the claim is that um, companies can. Companies can uh, generate above average profits uh, and that they can sustain that performance uh, over the long term. And the way to accomplish that is through an effective strategy. And one of the names, most popular names uh, associated with strategy um, is Michael Porter. Uh, so that is a name you need to know. Um, and he developed this idea of strategic positioning, uh, which is uh, the claim that um, in order for firms, um, in order for firms to sustain a competitive advantage, Right, in order for them to generate above average returns, above average profits over the long term, uh, they have to have a strategic position. And that strategic position is uh, preserving what's distinctive about their company. Uh, and what makes the company distinctive is that they are doing activities that are different or they're doing this, uh, similar activities as their competitors, but they're doing them in different ways. And the main takeaway here is that firms have some degree of control over their success and that they are not at the complete mercy of industry or the market or economic forces. Um, so uh, with the right kind of strategy, a firm can perform uh, very well. Okay, and then to sort of illustrate the whole strategic process, I uh, use Facebook's uh, Oculus Quest. Uh, they just recently had a uh, product launch with the Oculus Quest, so I use that as an example to sort of illustrate the strategic process. Um, the Oculus Quest is a virtual reality device. Um, and so this is part of their uh, virtual, virtual reality uh, efforts. Um, and they started this um, in 2014 when they purchased a company called Oculus. And Oculus made virtual reality headsets. And they bought this company for $2.3 billion. So they entered this market in a very big way. Um, that was a number of years ago. Um, and now today, they're at the point where they are making their own uh, headsets, their own uh, VR devices. Uh, it's called the Quest. Uh, it's pictured here on this woman. Um, and they just actually introduced the second generation uh, version of this headset uh, like two weeks ago. And so we'll use this, you know, as an example. Um, uh, as an example strategy as we go through the strategic management process. And so here is what the strategic management process looks like. This is all of the steps uh, that you go through in um, creating a strategy for a company. And it begins with establishing the mission, vision, and value statements for that company. So that orients that company in a, in a unique way. Um, and then from there, you assess the current reality, which is you make an assessment of the company and the environment it exists in. Uh, you want to see what works for the company, you know, what doesn't. Um, and, uh, you know, what does their industry look like? 
uh, what kind of competition are they up against? And uh, from that, you're able to determine like what the opportunities and threats are. And so after you make an assessment of the company and uh, the environment, um, that's when you formulate the actual strategy, given that information for the company. Um, and you'll formulate three different strategies. Uh, you'll formulate a strategy at the corporate level, the business level, and the functional level. Um, and these are all going to be uh, tied to each other. And of course, this, you know, we're going to go over this in detail um, as we move forward in this lecture. Um, uh, but that is where we actually ended off in the first lecture. And so uh, we're going to focus on that uh, in this lecture. Um, and then after you formulate the strategy, you have to actually uh, obviously execute on those strategies. That is the fourth step. And then maintain strategic control, which is just uh, checking to see how well you're doing in executing that strategy and making any adjustments that might be necessary. Um, and then, you know, based on that feedback, you make revisions and you start the process over again. So uh, we covered this in the, in the, in the first lecture. Uh, step one, establishing the mission, vision, and value statements. So I provided, so we're using Facebook's Oculus as an example. So I provided Facebook's mission and vision statements. Um, and basically that company, uh, its mission and vision is based on building community, uh, bringing people together, uh, enabling people to connect, right, and share ideas, um, share what's going on in the world, uh, these kinds of ideas. And so now that's going to provide sort of the foundation, the direction that you want uh, your company to head. And so, um, you know, everything that you do from that uh, is derived from those initial three statements. And so then in step two, we did an assessment of the current reality for Facebook. And then, so assessing the current reality is just looking at uh, what works for the company, what doesn't, and um, I introduced a number of different tools that you can use. Uh, an example is a SWOT analysis or forecasting. Uh, benchmarking is another example. Um, also, we did a VRIO analysis, uh, Brio analysis, I guess you can refer to it as. Um, and so we went through that analysis and now the, the VRIO analysis, um, what that does is that, that um, is an assessment of the resources and capabilities that a company may have uh, that may give it a strategic advantage. Um, and if you recall, I made the comment that uh, Michael Porter, um, he is, so Michael Porter, he, he, uh, he, he got his PhD in um, industrial economics. And so his, he, 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 he analyzes everything from that perspective, right? So uh, his understanding of business is through this lens uh, uh, which believes the industry plays a major role in the success or failure of companies, right? And so from his perspective, he wants to understand the industry. And uh, his ideas are based on um, uh, the claim that a firm's strategy for it to be successful has to be rooted in uh, the conditions of the industry it is competing within. So it's got that industry focus. An alternative uh, to that is uh, the resource-based view uh, or the capabilities view. And this idea is that um, companies generate uh, strategic advantages um, uh, from unique capabilities or resources that the company has. Right? And so that that is sort of the source of their sustained competitive advantage. It's uh, in a particular resource or collection of resources um, and capabilities 
uh, that the company was able to develop. And so the, the VRIO analysis is one way of trying to understand um, what resources and capabilities a firm might have um, that would give it a strategic advantage. And so uh, according to this analysis, um, and, and the name uh, associated with um, uh, this resource-based view, right, that the resources or capabilities of an organization is what gives it a strategic advantage is Jay Barney. Um, and I would argue that Jay Barney is every bit as sort of famous and, and, and influential as Michael Porter is. Um, and I also emphasize that uh, th these ideas shouldn't compete against each other. It's not one view or the other. It's not like one is correct and, and the other isn't. Um, these just give you, again, going back to this postmodern idea, they just give you different slices on reality, right? Um, and you want to expose yourself to many of these slices to get a richer, more fuller sense of what's going on in the world. Um, and so, in establishing your strategy, it's, it's probably a good idea, right, to look at capabilities and uh, resources. And it's also probably a good idea to look at the industry as well. I don't think that you should select one um, analysis or technique or strategy over the other, right? Both of these ideas can help inform you in uh, generating an effective strategy for a company that will lead to a sustained competitive advantage. So the VRIO analysis that we did, um, and again, uh, the basic idea here is that if a resource or capability is going to lead to a strategic advantage, then it must be valuable, rare, and costly or impossible for competitors to replicate. And so what we identified um, uh, was that Facebook doesn't, in fact, have a valuable resource, uh, which we believe gives it strategic potential, and that is its social network platform. And the reason why is because, so it, it, it checks off all of these four uh, conditions, right? So first of all, it's valuable. Uh, it, it's, its network, its social network platform has $2.6 billion, billion not dollars, 2.6 billion active monthly users. Um, and obviously that many customers is extremely valuable. Uh, it's also rare. So there are very few companies in the world uh, that have that kind of customer base, that, that, that have a customer base that is that large. Um, and it's also costly or impossible for competitors to replicate. Um, it, it, you know, most companies, a lot, many companies, uh, would like to have, you know, that many customers, uh, but it, it, that is not something that's easy to achieve. Um, and you know, no amount, amount of money could he guarantee that you can get, uh, that many members. Um, so. Um, and also they have an organization in place that can take advantage of this, right? That can exploit this resource. Um, and we know that because Facebook generates enormous revenue, uh, enormous profits, right? So they have the infrastructure, the capabilities in place uh, that are taking advantage of this resource that they were able to develop. So because of this, uh, we believe that Facebook does in fact uh, have a, uh, a resource that, that provides it with a, a strategic advantage. Now, looking from the industry uh, perspective, uh, one thing that you can do is a SWOT analysis. And SWOT is yet another acronym uh, that stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. So you want to look at the strengths and weaknesses uh, internally of the company. Um, and then you want to look at into the environment in which it operates and see what um, opportunities and threats exist. And uh, what we determined is that one strength it has is, is financial resources, right? So Facebook has a ton of money. Uh, so any new market that it enters, uh, it has the money to absolutely dominate in that market. Uh, it can do things um, in a very 
sort of powerful way. Um, and we identified an opportunity in the virtual reality market. This is a new market. Uh, it is a very fast growing market. It is at the very early stages of this market. And the expectation is that virtual reality devices and the whole sort of mixed reality spectrum will be the next computing uh, platform that will replace um, our current computers, right? And so it will be the device um, perhaps in a, uh, a glasses form factor uh, or some other kind of wearable uh, that will replace all of our other computing devices. And so that provides an enormous um, uh, market opportunity. And so that is the assessment of the current reality of Facebook, right? They have this massive resource uh, in their social network platform, and there is this opportunity um, uh, with the virtual reality uh, market that they might be able to exploit. Um, using that you know, resource, uh, so this is something that maybe they can get their billions of members uh, to take an interest in, um, and they have the financial resources uh, to uh, make an impact in this market in a, in a very big way. So that was step two. So now step three, we understand now where we stand. Um, the next step is to actually formulate the strategies. And the way this works is you will formulate first a, a strategy at the corporate level, um, and that will sort of serve as the foundation for uh, the strategies that the levels beneath the corporate level uh, adopt. And so uh, um, after the corporate level strategy, you want to develop a strategy at the business level, and that will be informed by uh, what you did at the corporate level. And then for each of those business level strategies, you will have uh, strategies for each of the uh, uh, functional level units. Um, and so this is sort of summarized in this, um, in this diagram here. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to go through the steps necessary to develop a strategy at each of these levels. And so, uh, the first step in this is to establish a corporate strategy. And this is going to represent a, a, uh, the mission and, and vision statements um, in, a, in a very sort of broad sense. And it's going to translate those statements into a, a general strategy uh, overall for the, the company. Um, and, it's, and it's basically how the mission is going to be accomplished. And there are three types of uh, corporate strategies that you could pursue. Uh, there is a growth strategy where you will look into um, expand in some way. So you might want to, or might be to, uh, to maximize your sales revenues or market share or the number of employees or number of customers. Um, the growth strategy is uh, something that a lot of tech companies employ. They are looking to maximize their, their growth. Uh, certainly companies that are in the startup phase uh, have adopted a growth strategy. Uh, stability is for companies who are doing really well and want to sort of maintain their strong position. And then a defensive uh, strategy would be one where your company is in a market perhaps that is uh, contracting, right? Um, or, you know, that may be transformed, it may be sort of coming to an end. An example of this would be the music industry and um, uh, the sales of records. Um, you know, that has essentially come to an end for uh, the music industry. It's, it's been a decline in uh, market now for a very, very long time. Most people now get their music for free online. Um, and so if you're a music company, uh, uh, your strategy for generating uh, revenue uh, from the sales of, let's say, singles or albums, um, that would be a defensive strategy that you would want, want to undertake because that is a dying market. So among these three strategies, uh, Facebook uh, would select a growth strategy uh, 
for their uh, VR sort of initiative. And the corporate strategy that Facebook established was to connect 1 billion users in virtual reality. Now, uh, the corporate strategy has to be tied to the uh, mission and vision and value statements, right? And so if you recall, those statements are all about, you know, bringing people together in a community. Uh, it is about connections among those people. It's about, you know, sharing of information and stories and what's going on in the world. And so uh, Facebook identified virtual reality as a new sort of um, uh, domain in which you can do that. Um, and, um, and since they're selecting a growth strategy, right, they want to enter the VR market in a very big way. And so what they set as a goal at the corporate level is to connect 1 billion users in virtual reality. They want a billion of their, uh, users to be involved in virtual reality. Um, so, you know, uh, purchasing headsets, right? Uh, making use of those headsets by logging into some virtual platform that Facebook controls, et cetera. So here is uh, sort of uh, a table of ways you can implement uh, the three uh, different types of corporate strategies. Um, I won't go through them all. You can look through this uh, to get a better sense, but um, Facebook uh, shows a growth strategy, right? And it accomplishes that. So you can see down here, um, it did that by, first it acquired a similar or a complementary business. So they actually did this. So their first step into VR, or one of their early steps into VR was to actually purchase um, Oculus. It, Oculus was a, a company uh, founded by Lucky Palmer, I believe is his name. Um, it was, and his company was started on Kickstarter. It was very, very successful. Uh, they're one of like the very first companies that um, produced a virtual reality headset. And um, uh, yeah, so the company was very successful. Uh, they did really well. They sold a bunch of those headsets. Uh, customers were very enthusiastic about it. Um, and they sold the company to Facebook for a couple of billion dollars. And so that really established Facebook as a major player within the VR industry. Um, and, and so the second item here expanded to new products or services. And so now uh, Facebook is all in on VR. Uh, after buying that uh, headset company, they are now making their own headsets, right? So they are uh, pushing the technology forward. Um, they're also developing the platform uh, for VR development, the software development. They have a lot of gaming companies now that produce, um, you know, gaming titles. Um, they have this whole initiative called the Infinity uh, Office. Um, so that, uh, which are tools like software tools so that you can use your virtual reality device to, uh, actually do work. Um, and, and what that looks like is you put on the actual headset and, um, when you have the headset on, you can see the room that you're in, um, um, and you can change that if you want, but it, you can see it like in black and white. Um, and then, but then it brings up like an infinite amount of screens, um, which, would you know be monitors the equivalent of physical monitors but all of these monitors these screens that you would use to do work on are all digitally created right so there is no limit to the amount of screens that you can create so you can have all of these you know screens throughout your entire room um or your desk and your virtual desk and, and they've developed also a uh a keyboard that enables you to type while you have this uh headset on so basically, it's, it's the, the very first steps um, in enabling you to actually regularly work within uh, virtual reality, and there's a lot of benefits to doing that. So, so that is, is their corporate strategy. 
Um, another tool that you can use to inform what you want to do at the corporate level is uh, this BCG matrix. Uh, BCG stands for Boston Consulting Group. Uh, Boston Consulting Group is one of the major consulting uh, firms. Uh, they recruit every year at uh, business schools. Um, this is something I talked a little bit about in the first week. Um, consulting firms um, are one of the sort of most desirable jobs uh, sought by uh, MBA graduates. So a, a, a very large percentage of MBA graduates go on to work at these consultant firms. And um, consultant firms love these types of uh, tools. Uh, so, and we'll talk uh, uh, about a few of them, but like things like SWOT analysis, uh, this matrix here, um, using these sort of frameworks to get an understanding of the industry, of the, of the firm, um, so they can better uh, sort of analyze what's working and what's not and where the opportunities are. Uh, what it is sort of challenges uh, that they have to deal with. And, and it provides this sort of uh, framework that enables you to, to clearly understand what's going on so you can recommend um, uh, solutions. And so a lot of this is used uh, uh, by consultants. Uh, and in fact, we're going we're gonna to go through one of them by uh, that Porter developed, uh, his Five Forces model, uh, which is uh, very popular. And in fact, if you um, interview at McKinsey, uh, there is an expectation that at some point you will make use of that uh, framework in an analysis that you do as part of their interviewing process. But the way that this uh, BCG matrix works is, so it's a two by two matrix. So you, what you want to do is uh, you want to analyze the business units within your company, right? So, all you know, within Facebook, they have many different business units. VR is now a new uh, business unit, um, but they also have. Actually, I don't. I don't even know what all the products are, but clearly they have. Um, um, they have the social networking site, right? That that's a big one. They have a gaming company. Um, they have obviously advertising. Um, I think they might be involved in um, hardware. I mean, they just got a million things that they got going on. So each of those would represent a business unit where they're trying to uh, generate profit from. And you want to divide them based on the market share that that business unit has and the growth rate of that market. Right. And so um, the idea is that dependent on so if you have um, a very low market share in an industry that is not uh, that has a very low growth rate, this is considered a dog. These are the kinds of business units you need to get out of. Um, and then on the other end, you would have cash cows. These are. Um, business units where the market is growing at a very slow rate, uh, perhaps because it's a mature market, uh, but you have a very high market share, right? So this probably generates a lot of cash for you. And the idea is you use this cash generated by these cash cows uh, to fund companies in this um, quadrant here. And the stars, are companies where you ha have a high market share um, in an industry that is growing at a very high rate. And so if I just click, um, Facebook right now uh, is located in this, you know, most ideal sort of quadrant within this BCG matrix, because by purchasing uh, the Oculus Company, uh, the Rift, they got they got ownership of the Rift headset, uh, which is the Oculus's uh, virtual reality headset, and that dominated the market. So most VR users use that headset, um, and so um, since then they've maintained their market share. Now they introduced the uh, 
um, Oculus Quest, uh, which I think will have an even, eventually go on to have an even greater market share. So their market share should only increase. But right now they have, I believe the highest market share. Uh, certainly it is a high market share and the VR market is growing at an enormous rate, like 75% or something like that yearly. Um, so, so the VR business unit is considered a star. Um, any ideas, obviously, uh, the stars are the business units that you want to keep. So another corporate strategy that you can pursue is the diversification strategy. Um, and uh, uh, there was uh, one student, one of the uh, sections who pointed this out, uh, so well done. Um, and this strategy is adopted by a lot of companies. And basically the idea is you get involved in lots of different companies uh, so that you can spread the risk that you are exposed to, right? So if one uh, company, you know, is an industry, in an industry that is slowing down or they're having issues, right? And so they're losing market share. Um, overall, uh, that, that slack may be picked up by another industry that's doing really well or another company within the industry uh, that is performing really well. Um, so overall, your company uh, is doing well and can maintain um, above average profits because it's got its hands in so many different kinds of businesses. And so that is the approach to the diversification strategy. It's, it's very effective. Vertical, vertical integration is another version of this diversification, but you're diversifying by um, expanding into businesses that provide the supplies you need. Uh, this, this is a strategy I know that Elon Musk likes with, with Tesla. Uh, so if you think about all of the, the companies that supply your firm, um, you would want to uh, gain ownership in those companies. Um, as a personal story, uh, one of my first businesses that I owned, they, they, and I think I, I don't know why I told the story, but I mentioned that I own one of the companies that I own was a constant promotion company. And my company was victim to the industry's vertical integration. Um, and so what happened was there was a um, rules passed that deregulated uh, the industry that allowed very large corporations to own multiple radio stations. And so you got these very big uh, companies that would all of a sudden just started buying up all of like these local uh, radio stations, right? So, uh, so here in New York, we have Z100, you know, PLJ, um, and you would have a single company buy all of these different radio stations. And then they would buy the concert promotion companies that uh, would put on uh, concerts locally. And then they would buy the venues where those concerts were held, right? And so essentially what they did was they vertically integrated the concert market, right? So they owned the venue, they owned the concert promotion company that produced the show, um, and they owned the radio station, which is the channel uh, that the artist uses to promote themselves, right? And so what happened to me was that uh, after that point, I wasn't able to get access to any artists because um, these very large companies would essentially say, hey, look, you need to, <laughs> you need to use us. Um, if you don't use us, you're not going to get access to... Uh, our venue, right? So if you don't use their uh, concert promotion company, so like the local uh, promoter here uh, that was bought up by uh, these very large companies was uh, Delsner Enterprises. So Ron Delsner uh, promoted a lot of the, the big shows here in New York City. And so he was bought out by one of these companies and then they bought like the Jones Beach Amphitheater, um, and they would own the radio stations, right? And so an artist would sort of have this one-stop shop with a single company, and by doing business with that company, they were sort of ensured that their music would get paid, played on their radio station, right, which would promote the artist. Um, 
And then they would have to use their in-house content promoter and their in-house venues, right? So you'd have to, you know, use Delta Enterprises to produce the show and you would have to uh, play the show at Jones Beach Amphitheater. Um, and if they went with me, right, they would lose out on all of that. And I didn't have access to a radio station to promote them, right? I didn't own venues or anything like that. So, um, so that was a dramatic change to that industry. Um, and it was the beginning of the demise of mine. Okay, so that completes the uh, sort of tools and methods uh, that you would use to devise a strategy at the corporate level. The next step is devising your uh, uh, business strategy. Um, that's specifically how, how you're going, just determine how you're going to compete at the uh, business unit level, right? And so what are you gonna to do to compete in the industry? And obviously the strategies at this level are going to be based on what you've established at the corporate level. And in the one taught in your textbook, they sort of break it down into two steps and they buy into uh, Porter's uh, sort of system or sort of approach to this. Um, and, and the first step is to do an assessment of your competitive forces. So it's, it's an assessment of your industry using Porter's uh, five forces uh, framework. And then step two, is you will select from four competitive strategies uh, to adopt in order to enter that industry. So let's see what both of those steps look like. So step one here is you do, this is essentially a way of doing an assessment of the industry. And if you recall, right, Michael Porter is all about industry and the industry is going to determine the strategies you need to pursue in order to uh, develop a sustained competitive advantage. Um, and you're going to do an analysis of these five forces in the industry. You want to look at who the new entrants to the industry are going to be. And here, um, what Facebook is looking at is what will Apple do? Apple will eventually enter the VR market. There's all sorts of rumors. They're investing a massive amount of money into developing uh, VR technology. They are developing the software, which they've already made available. Uh, so it's only a, a matter of when um, uh, Apple enters in this uh, market, and that will be a, a big disruption to the uh, position that um, Facebook currently uh, has established. Uh, the other power is the power of suppliers. So the headset that they use um, is making use of Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon uh, chipset called the, oh, it's actually, I have wait, XR2. Uh, this is the XR, it's, so it's not the XR1, it's the actual XR2 chip. Anyways, um, this is the only chip that makes Facebook's headset of the, uh, possible. Um, and so, the bargaining power of Qualcomm now is very large, right? And that's sort of a weakness in the industry. If you want to um, develop the kind of headset that Facebook has developed in the Quest, which is a standalone unit that doesn't need to be um, plugged into a computer, but yet is still very powerful, you need to use this chip. And this is the only chip on the market. So that represents an issue. The bargain power of buyers. So here, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, mass market consumers, they have very little um, bargaining power, I think, at this point within the VR industry. Threats of substitute products or services. Um, there will always be the question, uh, will consumers prefer, let's say, 2D gaming, right? And so uh, the early adopters, I think, to VR are going to be gamers and gamers are very committed to uh, the sort of 2D um, uh, version of gaming that, that, that's done on a regular computer and computer monitor. Um, and the audience for that is massive. Um, and so that is a very compelling alternative uh, for games. I don't think it compares. I think once you strap on a, uh, uh, a VR headset and you actually enter the world that you are playing the game uh, within, uh, there's just no comparison, right? I, I don't know how you go back to, you know, flat screens in the 2D world 
um, after you played the game by actually living and existing in that game world. Um, uh, but it is still a threat. Um, and then rivalry among competitors within the industry. Um, so right now, I mean, there is a degree of rivalry, but it's not that great. So I don't think this is a big deal for the industry. However, all of the major tech companies um, have sort of toyed with VR. Um, they're not all in at this point, and maybe they've decided it's just so maybe a little bit too early. Uh, so the rivalry now, not that big of a deal, uh, but it will be once this uh, industry begins to gain steam um, and starts generating some real money, um, that's going to attract the rest of the tech players. And of course, you always have these new startups, these, these unicorns, like, you know, like the magic leaps, if, if that name means anything to you, um, uh, that could always disrupt the industry. Um, and I mean, an example of this, I, I, I highlight Microsoft here because Microsoft has invested heavily in mixed reality. Um, and they have a VR initiative, but they sort of abandoned it. Um, and only because I just think that they don't think that the market is quite there yet. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure why they're doing that, um, but they do have very good technology that they've developed in-house. Um, so right now they're sort of on the sidelines, uh, but they have you know, definitely the resources and, and capabilities uh, to enter this market and and dominate. So that's definitely uh, a threat that uh, Facebook needs to pay attention to. Uh, so all of these forces uh, together will determine uh, the opportunities available and the challenges in a particular industry. And it'll ultimately determine uh, the profitability of that industry, right? And so if we were to do this uh, you know, competitive forces, the five forces analysis for the airlines industry, it would be very different than it would be for doing it um, in VR. VR is, I think, going to be a very high profit, high growth type of industry um, with lots of opportunities. Um, and the exact opposite is true, I think, for the airline industry. Uh, and so this, this tool, the, the port is the five forces, this is one of the most popular tools companies use. Love this, right? So if you're gonna be interviewing at McKinsey uh, or any of them, uh, Boston Consultant Group, Bain, um, they're gonna, you're gonna need to at some point make use of this uh, during your interview uh, when they uh, question you about uh, strategy and the like. Um, but certainly it's, it's going to be a tool you're going to use uh, as a uh, manager when you participate in the formulation of strategies. Okay, so you've done analysis of your industry, you know where your industry stands. Um, Facebook did it for VR, they like what they saw, they see high growth, they see lots of opportunities, lots of profitability. Now the question is, um, what is your strategy for entering that market? And so Porter, Michael Porter, developed these four competitive strategies. I could have broken this out into a, another two by two matrix that probably would have been, um, it made it easier to understand. But so the way you want to look at this is these four strategies um, are divided into uh, the scope of the strategy. And so by scope, I mean, uh, are you targeting a wide market? So are you targeting a lot of customers or are you targeting a narrow market? So a, a niche market, a, a niche uh, set of customers, right? So the first two target a wide market, the second two target a narrow market. Um, and so that's your scope. And then the other uh, dimension would be your actual strategy. And is your strategy based on cost and prices or is your strategy based on differentiation, right? So you wanna select based on your strategy and based on your scope. And that will come and that will, you know, lead you to one of these four strategies. And so when you look at Facebook's uh, VR business strategy, I think it's clear that they're going to target a wide market, right? So the corporate strategy is to connect, you know, uh, a billion people. 
Um, so that's not a niche market, right? This is a, as, as wide a market as you can pursue. So they're definitely targeting a wide market. Um, and uh, also what I think they're doing is they want to enter the market both on uh, cost, uh, they want to lead on cost, so they want to offer a product that is much cheaper than what's available, um, and they also want to differentiate. Uh, so they want to offer a superior product. Um, often you would choose one of these two, so you would only select one of these four strategies. Uh, Facebook though, I think has come up with a strategy where they could uh, pursue both of these. Um, and so what they've done essentially is, you know, they want an affordable VR headset. And so the, their Oculus Quest is only $299. Now the competition, with the competition, you have to buy a headset and you have to plug that headset into a computer. And these computers have to be very powerful to run uh, VR games. VR games require more compute power than standard 2D games. Uh, that's because you got to render the game for two different screens, a screen that goes into your right eye and a screen that goes into your left eye. Uh, so you need powerful computers. So, you know, the, the, the alternative to the Oculus Quest is maybe a five or $600 headset plus maybe a $1,500 computer, right? And, and that sort of entry level. Um, so it's very expensive. Now, compared to that, you know, a Facebook introduces a product for just $300 and you're all in. You got the computer, you got the headset, you got everything. Um, and so uh, that is their, uh, so th that's their cost leadership strategy. And then the differentiation strategy, I think is simplicity. Um, you know, their device does not require a computer. Um, it makes it very simple. If you get an alternative headset, um, these headsets come with a, a number of wires that you got to plug into your device. Uh, the early sort of generations of these um, also needed sensors that you needed to set up into your room, and those needed to be connected to, to your computer. Uh, so it was a very complicated process. It, it's, it's not the kind of process that you can imagine a billion people undertaking, right? These are um, early adopters that are going to go through the process of getting all of this stuff to work. Um, and so it's not a mass market product. What Facebook did was they created a mass market product. They, they uh, came in and, and I think are completely disrupting the industry uh, by making a, uh, an all-in VR headset, uh, computer, headset, and everything built into one simple to use device for very cheap. And so that is uh, Facebook's uh, business strategy. Okay, and so that completes step three. We've established our business strategy. The textbook actually, so you probably notice um, that we skipped over, let's see. Where are we, where are we, where are we, where are we, where are we? There we go. Okay, so you want, you're going to have a, bad, uh, a strategy at the functional level, right? Um, the textbook, I think, skipped over the functional level. Um, and so I won't say a lot about it, but obviously, uh, you, you know, your strategy at the functional level will be informed by, you know, whatever unit these functions are serving, right? And so, you know, marketing communications, at some point, Facebook has to market their VR device, um, one strategy that they used for accomplishing that was to announce it at their annual uh, VR uh, conference. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. Um, but it, it was odd that your, your textbook totally skipped over that. Um, so that completes step number three uh, of the strategy uh, process. Uh, and then that brings us to step four. So you've established your strategies. Now, obviously, you have to execute them. And that's just now putting the strategic plans into effect. And the challenge here is that 
you know, there's going to be a seemingly endless amount of roadblocks uh, that you will have to confront in order to put this plan in place. Um, and so there's a whole, you know, process and efforts and systems that need to be in place um, in order to make sure that this actual this strategy actually gets uh, executed. And uh, a consultant firm recently did a uh, survey of, of executives and they consider the execution of strategy to be one of the greatest challenges for managers. Um, and this is going to be uh, likely one of your uh, challenges uh, or most significant challenges is the execution of the actual strategies uh, that the company puts in place. Uh, some of the things you'll be doing to make sure that it gets executed and executed effectively uh, is a lot of questioning, analysis, and follow through. Um, and, you know, nobody loves meetings. Uh, actually, I don't mind meetings. I know everyone hates meetings. You, uh, I like meetings. I feel like they are productive. I guess you can do enough of them where they become unproductive. Uh, but meetings are necessary to make sure everyone's on the same page and that we are moving forward. Right? You need to uh, confirm that everyone understands what the plan is, that everyone understands how to effectively uh, execute the plan, um, and you need to do an analysis to make sure that you're getting the desired results. Right? Um, and you know this requires meetings. It, it requires a constant engagement with all of the workers to fully understand you know what's happening on the front lines um and you know a strategy can be sort of a very heady type of um activity right and you know you, you develop these grand plans in your head and devise these you know very compelling uh plans and ideas for conquering new industries right and it all sounds great on paper uh, but at the end of the day, you got to make that, uh, you got to turn that into reality. Uh, and sometimes reality doesn't want to go along with your grand plans. Um, and that's where, you know, the heavy work and the heavy lifting gets done. Um, and so that's going to be a significant challenge um, as a manager. And this is sort of, this is referred to as building a foundation of execution. And so it's just a, like a checklist of items that, you need to be um, consulting on a regular basis to make sure that your plan is getting um, executed, right? And so, uh, you know, you want to constantly engage with your people so that, you know, everyone's on the same page and everyone's executing effectively. Uh, you want to, you know, set clear goals and priorities. You, you want to make sure people are doing the things that are most important. Um, you don't want to get Bogged, on, bogged down in the minutiae that really doesn't move the ball forward. Um, you know, and, and there's a, a sort of tendency for people to do that, right? There's a tendency, there's gonna be a tendency for a lot of people to resist what the strategy is. They'll think it's the wrong direction. They'll think it's uh, unrealistic. Um, they'll think that maybe they don't have the competencies to, to effectively execute it. Uh, it will maybe increase the difficulty of their work. And so they want to, you know, settle back into tasks that are much easier uh, to sort of do, um, but don't really, you know, move the whole initiative forward. Uh, so these are the things that you want to stay on top of, uh, expand people's capabilities. So this is something we'll talk a little bit about um, in leadership, uh, but it's the idea that uh, when you are playing a management role, uh, you want to uh, be able to improve sort of the, the capabilities of the people that you work with. Um, and uh, uh, you want to make sure that they're sort of moving forward in their careers, they're gaining um, uh, more skills, they're, they're, they're becoming more competent in their skills. Um, and so this is an important uh, part of the process and it's, it pays off, uh, the dividends pay off when you have these people, you know, um, as part of your strategic plan. Um, yeah, so this is a list that you need to consult to make sure that you are effectively um, executed. 
Uh, let me just see. Okay. All right, so, so that completes step four, uh, the execution, and then the final step of the process, step five is uh, maintaining strategic control, the feedback loop. And so here, you just wanna monitor the execution of the strategy uh, and take corrective action, right? And so you're engaging regularly with the people on the front lines who are putting this plan in place uh, and you wanna do an assessment of the results that it's generating. And you wanna make sure that your strategy is working, right? The strategies that you put in place are actually uh, delivering on the results that you expect. And to the degree that they are not, you need to take corrective action. You need to understand why things aren't working um, and, um, and make the uh, necessary changes uh, to bring you back on course. Um, and so they give you sort of uh, four key points uh, uh, that are useful in uh, making sure that you are on track, and that is engage people in what they need to do. Um, so you want to have constant contacts uh, with people uh, to make sure that they understand uh, what the strategy is, what the plan is, um, and what they are trying to achieve. Um, you want to keep the plan. And simple, um, you know, this just makes everyone's life and work easier. Uh, the more complexity you add, uh, the more pos the greater the possibility for errors and, and, and derailment. Uh, so you want to simplify uh, wherever possible. Stay focused on what's important, right? Don't get bogged down in the minutia and keep moving toward your goals, right? It's um, you know, the status quo is very compelling for a lot of organizations. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, often there's a lot of sort of um, gravity uh, that keeps organizations uh, in place. Um, and, and, and people do well, uh, there are lots of people who do well with the status quo. And so uh, when you're moving on a new initiative or on a new strategy, um, you know, you can be buttoned up against resistance because uh, people, a lot of people prefer uh, the status quo. So you want to make sure you're always moving towards your goals. And uh, so that pretty much ends this lecture. Um, so this last slide, what question should a strong strategic plan address? I think this is a good sort of checklist to go through uh, to, to make an assessment of the strategy uh, that you have devised. Uh, so I would encourage you to go through each of these questions. Uh, I believe this list is in the back of your textbook. Um, uh, they are very useful uh, in making sure that you are addressing the important issues that, that a strategy must address in, in uh, creating an effective strategy for a firm. Um, and so we will end there. Uh, and as always, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send me an email and I will see you in the next class. Take care.